Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar series. Uh, today is going to be an amazing uh, seminar, so thank you very much for joining us. My name is Karol Chanota. I'm the Senior Science Advisor for the Exploring for the Future program uh, that looks at uh, Australia's potential for minerals, energy and groundwater resources, uh, and this work that Marcus will be presenting is part of that. Uh, as part of that program, we have the privilege of uh, studying uh, the entire continent, and uh, with that in mind, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters, sky and community. And we pay our respect to the peoples, the cultures and the elders past and present. We have a great privilege uh, to study this continent and it's wonderful to partner uh, with peoples and communities um, across it. So uh, today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Marcus Haynes, uh, who will be introducing us to Green Steel Economic Fairways. Marcus is a geophysicist within the Mineral Systems Branch at Geoscience Australia. Marcus completed a PhD at the Australian National University in 2021, undertaking a Bayesian reappraisal of the geothermal heat flow through the Australian continent. Marcus joined Geoscience Australia in 2007, initially as a cadet while studying at the university before going through the graduate program in 2012. During his career, Marcus has worked across various domains, including geothermal energy, mineral prospectivity, seismic tomography, remote sensing, geophysical inference, and techno-economic modeling. The common thread being a focus on computational geoscience. In recent years, Marcus has been the module leader for the Economic Fairways and Lithospheric Geophysics modules of the Exploring for the Future program. And in 2023, the Economic Fairways project team were awarded the Australian Museum's Eureka Prize for Innovation Research in Sustainability. Um, I also say that Marcus is an amazing orator, so you're in for a treat today with an amazing clarity of thought. No pressure, Marcus, but uh, we know you're going to deliver. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Marcus to the podium uh, to give his uh, seminar. I grew up in the Hunter Valley, north of Sydney. As a boy, for me, the big smoke was Newcastle. And big smoke wasn't wrong. The Newcastle steelworks were in many ways the heart of the city until its closure in 1999. And it's no coincidence that Newcastle came to develop a steel industry. It, it had the right characteristics. It had access to iron ore shipped across from South Australia. It had close proximity to demand for steel in Sydney, but also Brisbane and Melbourne. And importantly, it had access to cheap energy in the form of coal. Coal isn't just found anywhere. It's the product of the right sequence of events happening in geological time. And for Newcastle, it was events in the Permian, some 250 to 300 million years ago that came to shape geography in the 20th century. So as we look to the future, to new ways of producing steel, what factors will influence steel making potential? How can geoscience help us to map the opportunities and the challenges for steel making in Australia. As we think about Australia's future and themes of geology and geography, it, it's pertinent to take pause and for an acknowledgement of country. And I'd like to echo Carol's words that Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, cultures, the elders past and present. The Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper Project is a collaboration between Geoscience Australia and Monash University. So for, for Geoscience Australia, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and for Monash University, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. Steel fuels development. Data from the World Steel Association reveals where steel is made and where it is consumed. We can see that China dominates, but there are large contributions too, from India, Japan, and other Asia. I think there are a couple of stories in these charts. First of all, they're very similar. 
Largely, steel is produced where it is consumed. And second, at least on a global stage, Australia doesn't produce or consume much steel at about 0.3 to 0.4%. So why do we care? 193 billion dollars. That's the value of Australian exports for global steelmaking value chains in the 2022 to 23 financial year from the provision of steel feedstocks like these majestic banded iron formations. The Department of Industry, Science and Resources reports that for that financial year, Australia exported 895 million tonnes of iron ore, largely from the Pilbara in Western Australia, earning $129 billion, and 170 million tonnes of metallurgical coal, largely from Queensland and New South Wales, earning $64 billion. Australia's role within steelmaking value chains provides more than 41% of combined commodity export earnings and contributes over 5.5% to our GDP. We don't make much steel, but steel making value chains are incredibly important to Australia's prosperity. However, steel making is an energy and carbon intensive industry. If we look at global greenhouse gas emissions, then the contribution from steel making is shown here in the yellow segment. That's over 7% of the total budget. According to the International Energy Agency, if the world is to hit the target of net zero by 2050, then the emissions intensity of steel production needs to drop significantly in the short term. And at the same time, some forecasts suggest an increasing demand for steel, particularly as development ramps up across Asia and Africa. So, we're moving into a world that needs less emissions, but potentially more steel. Australia relies on traditional steelmaking value chains, but these chains are facing potential disruption. To understand how things might change, we need to have a first, uh, a quick primer in steelmaking. And please recognise that this is some massive simplifications, but I do that in order to highlight some of the key points. Traditional steelmaking is a two-step process. In the first phase, iron oxides and metallurgical coal are fed into the blast furnace. At high temperatures, the coal produces carbon monoxide. The role of carbon monoxide is that of a reducing agent. It strips the oxygen from the iron oxides <coughs> to produce liquid iron and carbon dioxide. The blast furnace produces a transient product known as pig iron. This is treated in the basic oxygen furnace to further remove impurities and to produce an alloy, steel. The specific makeup of the alloy depends upon the desired properties of the steel. But this general process can be referred to as the BF-BOF steel making room. So, what's the alternative? Internationally, there is a growing interest to deploy hydrogen in the role of a reducing agent. Hydrogen isn't an energy source in a, in a conventional sense, but it does undertake chemical work. Hydrogen can be sourced in different ways. Substituting coal with natural gas has been reported to reduce the carbon intensity of steel by on the order of 50%. However, if the hydrogen is generated from electrolysis and the whole process electrified using renewable energy, then the carbon intensity can be reduced by up to 95%. There are a number of technologies on the table to achieve a transition to hydrogen steelmaking. Here, we show the green hydrogen-based direct reduction iron shaft furnace to electric arc furnace, or H2DRIEAF. We focus on the DRIEAF technology as it is already being funded, contracts are already being signed, and it is being deployed to produce low-carbon low steel in Sweden at the hybrid plant. Changing to new technologies, however, also comes with changes in process requirements. An important consideration here is that not all iron ores are the same. The annual Australia's Identified Mineral Resources Report, which is produced by our Minerals Advice Team here at Geoscience Australia, 
shows the distribution of Australia's known iron ore resources. And broadly, they can be categorised into two main types. Hematite, shown here in red, and magnetite, shown in black. There are some exceptions, but generally these resources were formed under the same sorts of processes. Hematite, however, has seen subsequent upgrading through prolonged weathering. Iron oxides are fairly stable in the environment, so when these rocks weather, it's, it's generally the gang, the, the, the sort of rubbish we don't really want in the ore, things like silica, aluminium, uh, phosphorus, that tends to get removed. To the extent that these ores can be more or less dug up, shipped out, and used in traditional BF, BOF steel making. Because of this, about 97% of Australians, Australia's iron ore production is from these so-called direct shipping ores. In contrast, magnetite ores typically have lower concentrations of iron, at about 30%. But the iron in these ores is magnetic, and this can be exploited to upgrade the ores. The concentrates produced from magnetite ores are of higher quality, both in their iron content and in having lower concentrations of gang. The extra processing requires energy and money, so magnetite ores are more expensive to produce. Currently though, it's these higher quality concentrates that are needed within hydrogen-based DRI EAF steelmaking. So that's been an incredibly brief and simplified bit of context setting. But I think it gets us to a really key point. When we're thinking about the future, and about potential global transition from traditional BF, BOF steelmaking to a hydrogen-based DRI EAF, what does that future look like for Australia? To answer this question, it's helpful to think back to Newcastle, the Newcastle Steelworks, and how that facility came to be developed there. I don't think that the fundamental drivers back then are really any different to the future. It's about access to markets, access to iron ore, and access to cheap energy. But it's the context behind these factors where we start to see the differences. So to answer the question at the top, we need to think about the new influences on these old factors, how they come together to define green steelmaking potential. And this is where our project comes in. To address these challenges, Geoscience Australia and Monash University have been collaborating on the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. It represents a novel approach for spatial techno-economic modelling of green iron and steel projects. It's just one part of a broader economic fairways project, which seeks to provide mapping tools that are designed to inform decision making in the development of Australian resource projects. They provide rapid, high level spatial assessments that can be used to inform decision makers in industry, government, finance, academia, or communities. Developed under the Exploring for the Future program, our tools and software codes aim to support a range of commodities, including base and precious metals, critical minerals, mine tailings, hydrogen, ammonia, carbon capture and storage, and steel making. In 2023, we were awarded the Australian Museum's Eureka Prize for innovative research in sustainability. That was fantastic recognition, but I mention it here to highlight that that award was judged on the basis of impact. And we're already seeing these tools have real impact in industry and government. And it gives us some confidence to approach problems like green steel, knowing that these techniques, these capabilities, are really filling a void and improving Australia's competitiveness. Before we get to the details of the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper, I do want to set the bar for what we're trying to achieve. The real core of the project is to have user-driven, integrated assessments of potential. It comes back to the theme I was discussing earlier of geoscience influencing geography, but leveraging modern computational geoscience to assess that in a detailed, quantitative way, bringing together different factors like geological resources, physical infrastructure, the availability and variability of renewable energy, of resource economics and engineering. But assessments in isolation aren't enough. We want to inform 
a better understanding of Australia's distinct advantages, of the main opportunities and barriers to steel decarbonisation, of Australia's position within value chains. Do we continue with existing business models or is it viable that we bring some of that value onshore? All this we seek to make accessible and transparent by openly releasing tools and software. Ultimately, we're looking to have genuine impact by providing information that can inform decision making in the earliest stages of thinking about steel industry development in Australia. It takes time to see those sorts of aspirations realised, but I hope to show you some of our progress against these top four aims. And it's probably worth noting also at this stage what we're not trying to do. We're not trying to green light projects. We're not undertaking pre-feasibility and feasibility studies. This is much more about understanding the broad contours of the problem, defining the pertinent questions, and developing a framework from which to launch more detailed follow-up studies. We're not looking specifically at the act of transitioning, that is to say, we're not looking at how we go from where we are now to where we could be. We're costing out the developments of projects from scratch and modelling what things could look like. How do we do this? The challenge of looking at uh, green steel is that the costs are obfuscated due to the presence of multiple interconnected um, resource facilities. You can see here in the middle of this diagram <coughs> the electrolyzer uh, providing hydrogen to the DRI EAF uh, steel making route that I introduced earlier uh, before steel is, is um, cast and rolled and provided to consumers. All of this uh, is supported by wind and solar photovoltaic um, renewables with battery and hydrogen storage. We bring all of these components together within a self-consistent model which optimises the system capacities based on site conditions. The sizing of the various components is conditional on the assumed costs of each technology. We have our own opinions but we also give freedom to users to modify these cost assumptions. The storage options, which are shown here in uh, purple, provide operational flexibility. The battery storage provides hours of electricity to balance variable energy supply on the order of days. Hydrogen tanks, on the other hand, um, provide storage on the order of months to balance out seasonal variations in renewable energy. Road or rail transport to the nearest port can be considered in two stages, as are shown by the stars. First, after the shaft furnace, to model the costs of producing green iron, or <coughs> after casting and rolling, to model the costs of producing green steel. This model assumes a high level of vertical integration. That is, the steel maker is also the hydrogen producer and the energy utility. You can split these components apart but it adds extra inefficiencies and would mean that the steelmaker doesn't have the same level of energy security over the project. In order to run the model, we need to compile real-world renewable energy data. We use the Renewables Ninja API to collect hour-by-hour hour wind and solar photovoltaic data for the year 2019 on a five-kilometer grid. This is a large volume of data, and to make the problem tractable, we've undertaken some regional prioritization. For this, We've been able to leverage some of the earlier work, um, looking at lowest cost options for hydrogen production using the Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool. The top percentiles for different input energy sources are shown here. Solar in yellow, wind in dark green, and a hybrid wind and solar mix in light green. We spatially intersect these regions with those of known iron ore resource endowment. And we use this combined region to prioritise where we're going to collect data and run the modelling. With all of the pieces of the puzzle now in place, we've developed and launched the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper, which you can access here at portal.ga.gov.au slash persona slash green steel. This is a screenshot of the landing page and you can see the prioritised regions where the tool can be run outlined in red. 
We launched an initial beta version of this tool at a workshop with industry, academia and government in late August last year. And since then, we've been incorporating the feedback and the discussions from that workshop. And now we're happy to release version 1.0, and that's available online right now. Geoscience Australia's developers, and I'd like to give a particular acknowledgement to the work of Ruben Turk, uh, Simon van der Wielen, and the whole team. They've done an amazing job of, of putting together the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper and the Exploring for the Future Data Discovery Portal. It gives me the confidence to be able to stand in front of people and do live demonstrations of these sorts of tools. The Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper is more complex than other commodities we've looked at in the past. The optimization routine takes on the order of minutes to tens of minutes to run to completion. So it's, it's not practical to do a live demonstration for this sort of um, presentation. But I have pre-canned some of the results to give you a, a taste of the uh, insights and capabilities that the tool can provide. So here's an example of using the tool to produce a national scale map of the estimated um, levelized costs of steel. By levelized, we mean that we're calculating the full project costs and averaging them per unit of production. So in this case, per ton of steel. This is, I guess, in some sense, the, the main visualization uh, produced by the mapper and summarizes how the various components come together to influence costs. This particular example is for a 1 million ton per annum steel making facility, assuming our technology costings for the year 2025. One uh, megaton per annum is, is a fairly modest facility. If you look globally, steel making plants generally range in capacity from 0.5 to up to about five uh, megatons per annum. I also wanna stress that we're looking at islanded systems. This is all of the components um, existing in the same location and not connected to an outside transmission network. Another important assumption is that uh, an iron ore price is one of the input parameters. We want a tool that's, um, I guess, in some sense, generalizable and flexible. At the moment, Australia doesn't produce uh, much uh, magnetite relative to hematite even though that's a requirement for these new steel making facilities. <coughs> There's a lot of research going on at the moment to look at opportunities to enable hematite to be used in hydrogen steel making. Um, but that research is ongoing. So rather than picking winners and losers in terms of where we're gonna source um, the iron ore from, we've assumed for this model, a cost of $150 per tonne for high quality magnetite pellets. That's based on the costs that are paid import in China. So it already incorporates some aspect of transporting these materials. We can see from, from this model that relatively uh, low cost options are distributed across most Australian states and territories, uh, particularly in Southwest WA, Central WA, Central Australia, uh, South Australia around the Eyre Peninsula and in uh, sort of Central Queensland. But we can also get a breakdown into what's gone into the model to come up with these estimates of cost. Um, here, I've looked at a particular example, um, interrogating the model at a point in, uh, near Albany in Southwest WA. And we can see that these cost estimates are coming from assuming 718 megawatts of installed solar, 798 megawatts of installed wind, supported by 438 megawatts of battery storage and over 1,000 tonnes of hydrogen storage tanks. <clears throat> to put those figures into some sort of context, I was looking at the uh, energy production on the West Australian grid uh, during the last week. That peaked at just under 3,000 megawatts. So the installed capacity for a fairly modest steelmaking plant uh, equates to a, maybe a, a quarter to a third of the current West Australian grid. There's a real scale to the problems that, you know, the challenges that we're facing with the transition towards green decarbonizing, decarbonized steel. But at the same time, the opportunities are large too. This kind of hints that um, we can dig a little bit deeper you know, beyond just cost estimates. And I wanna give a few examples of how this tool can be used to drive insights. 
The first example I'd like to talk about is that of hydrogen storage. Underground storage is much cheaper for large-scale storage of hydrogen than other forms. The mapper assumes that the costs of hydrogen storage reflect on-site storage in above-ground hydrogen tanks. It's a, um, a good assumption because it's a technology that can be deployed anywhere. However, there is a growing interest in geological storage options for hydrogen in salt caverns and, to a lesser extent, depleted gas fields. Internationally, uh, there are examples where salt caverns are already being used for the industrial storage of hydrogen, with working capacities ranging from just under 1,000 <coughs> to over 8,000 tonnes of hydrogen. Salt cavern storage has been estimated to be up to 90% cheaper than above-ground compressed tanks for longer-term hydrogen storage cycles. Australia has examples of thick salt structures that, that may be suitable for storage, though more fundamental research is required to confirm specific sites. And I can run through a few examples. <clears throat> if we consider the Malawa Formation in the Canning Basin in Western Australia, uh, we've observed thick um, salt accumulations there, although the salts that we have observed tend to be in interbedded with other materials. So for forming a cavern, they're not going to form a tight seal, and it's not at this stage, uh, a great storage option. But there could be salt structures out there that we have yet to identify. If, if such structures could be identified, we can see that they would be of high relevance to a steelmaking facility in the Pilbara. Here, the requirement for hydrogen tank storage is relatively high, close to 3,000 tonnes. And we can begin to put some back-of-the-envelope numbers on what the impact of hydrogen storage options in the Canning Basin would be. In this case, um, such a, such a storage target would have a maximum cost reduction of up to $138 per tonne. Similarly, there are some thick salts that have been observed in the Kilru Formation, the Polder Basin in South Australia. These look uh, are more promising than those of the Canning Basin, though they are located offshore, uh, so they're a little bit more expensive to get to. Also, the hydrogen storage requirements in the Eyre Peninsula are not as high as the Canning Basin. Nevertheless, identifying a viable target there could save up to $95 per tonne on our overall cost estimates. So I think these examples highlight how we can use pragmatic production scenarios to identify regions where steel making may have viability and use that for regional prioritization into future research of Australian geological salt structures. But not just that, we also get an insight into the potential payoffs of doing that, of how Australia's competitiveness improves and how that would aid a transition towards green steel making and increase the pace of action. As another example, I'd like to talk about energy curtailment. Now you can think of curtailment as energy wastage, although uh, more accurately, for instance, it looks a little bit more like not running a wind turbine when it could be spinning. In this figure, we have a little peak under the hood of the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. We can see the hour by hour energy flows over the, through the system over the course of a week. We can see renewable energy generation shown here in green. We have consumption from the furnaces as is shown in the thin orange bar. It's a relatively minor component but constant. The hydrogen electrolyzer shown in teal, is a big consumer of energy. And our curtailment is shown here in red. It, it tends to occur mainly in those diurnal pulses for this example, when solar capacity exceeds the uh, electrolyzer capacity. <clears throat> it's perhaps a um, under-recognized feature of these sorts of systems, that this is the solution you get for a well-optimized system. In order to have the lowest costs of production, it's actually more beneficial to oversize the renewable energy generation so that we can run the electrolyzers, which tend to be more expensive, at higher capacity for longer. So there's, a, I guess, a real opportunity here in terms of excess energy that could be available for other uses. And it gives us, I think, uh, an opportunity to look at 
situations where common infrastructure usage could also drive down the costs of steel production. So we can take uh, things like average energy curtailment as a project characteristic and map that across Australia for the same one megaton per annum steel making plant. If we take Port Hedland for Australia, uh, for example, on the West Australian coast, the annual curtailment is 1.4 terawatt hours. Now again, that, that's a number that might be hard to sort of put into context, but if we were able to realize an income on that of three cents in the kilowatt hour, that curtailed energy would further supplement the levelized costs of steel by up to $42 per tonne. Now, how could, how could we um, see an income stream like that? Well, it could occur through um, coupling steelmaking uh, industries with other agile industries or through the production of excess hydrogen and ammonia. These could be used, uh, for example, for international shipping to decarbonize the exports of the steel or could be exported directly to our international partners to help them realize their hydrogen and decarbonization ambitions. Existing industries or communities could also possibly tap into these resources. It would be cheap energy, <coughs> but um, they could potentially look at you know, what the costs of building the transmission lines are, what the costs of firming this uh, energy is. The energy itself is already factored into um, the steelmaking process. But again, we, can, we have this situation where we can look at where are the pragmatic production scenarios? Where is steelmaking potentially viable? And where are these common infrastructure usage um, options sort of opening up? Another example of the use of the, of the tool is to undertake regional comparisons. So here I'm showing not just the levelized cost estimates, but also how that is broken down into individual um, system components. And we have these estimates for Port Hedland in Western Australia and the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia, both for our assumed technology costings for the year 2025 and how they would reflect um, drops in the prices of technologies in 2050. We can see that the overall energy and, and hydrogen costs are a little bit lower in the Eyre Peninsula. The wind and solar renewable energy is a little bit more complementary. The seasonal variations are less. So we're paying less for our installed capacity, less for battery and hydrogen storage. Conversely, the point that I've selected here in the Air Peninsula is a little bit further from the existing transportation infrastructure. So there are higher transportation costs <coughs> relative to Port Hedland. The end result of these competing factors is that the levelized costs for these areas come out somewhat similarly but when we look at the breakdown, we get a little bit more insight into the individual pressures, the individual nuances and challenges of realizing an industry in these regions. And it's not just you know, Port Hedland and the Air Peninsula. We can produce these sorts of metrics for any location in these maps. And I've pre-canned a whole bunch of them, um, which I won't get time to look at in this talk. Um, but I, I might drop into one just to give another example. Let's take a look at the, uh, the, the relatively low costs that have been modelled in Albany in Western Australia. What I want to give an insight into with, with this particular example is, I suppose, it's not just being able to estimate costs. Those in isolation, it's, it's hard to put a meaning, attach a meaning to that. We can also then make comparisons to you know, what are the costs of traditional BF, BOF steelmaking? Are these low costs actually pointing us towards a viable industry or not? So here I've plotted the levelized cost estimates that we get for Albany against a longer term average um, steel price of 820 Australian dollars per tonne. Now these are highly variable. You know, there's a lot of nuance and uncertainty that goes into that. But I think it's encouraging that we see a longer term pathway just from technology cost reductions alone that by 2050 these are coming out pretty comparable. So it's hinting that there are possible options for a viable green steel industry competing with traditional steel. But we also know that internationally there's a movement towards our more regulated markets. We've seen in the European Union the introduction of the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM. It's designed to add tariffs to carbon intensive products that are being imported into the EU, like steel. Wood Mackenzie estimate that by the end of the CBAM phasing period, 
which is towards the end of this decade, the cost of CBAM for some key exporters to the EU could exceed 275 US dollars per tonne. So I've added that on top of the traditional steel as well. And it gives you an idea, I suppose, that the pace of you know, when these technologies transition and become more competitive is probably going to be dictated by actions in regulated markets. Now, the, the EU, I recognize, was not a massive um, producer and consumer of steel relative to, to Asia, but it points at that movement, I think, that we're seeing. Um, so being able to put prices on where we see Australian steel production is important for understanding what the pathway towards decarbonisation might look like and what the opportunities are for Australia. At the heart of these techno-economic approaches is this sort of comparative process. It's about asking what the alternative is and then being able to run some numbers. These various <coughs> scenarios show that the, the mapper allows us to do this in detail, domestically, within Australia. But in many ways, that's also only half the picture. To genuinely assess the potential, then we need to have an understanding of the production costs that are available in other jurisdictions. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we go out, out of our way to build mapper tools for other countries. I have enough on my plate. However, our Monash University partners have undertaken some additional research, extending on the mapper tool that I'm showing today, to also consider the optimal value chain positioning of Australia with respect to our international trading partners. And as a case study, we focus on a supply chain um, between Port Hedland in Australia and the Port of Tokyo in Japan. And just as, as a quick side note, the red line here shows the great circle um, connecting those locations. It's not indicative of the actual shipping route, just to um, get in front of that question. In total, we looked at five different options for the production of green steel. Option one, at the top, looks at full production in Australia and the export of steel to Japan. If we drop to the bottom to option five, we're looking at a more traditional business model with export of ores from Australia and steel making in Japan, where renewables take the form of offshore wind. Options three and four see the development of an Australian hydrogen industry with hydrogen exported alongside ores for steel making in Japan. Given that there are some technical difficulties with the shipping of hydrogen, option four adds in the conversion to ammonia prior to export and the subsequent cracking back to hydrogen on arrival in Japan. Option two splits the iron making and the steel making processes. Hydrogen is used domestically within Australia to produce uh, hot bracketed iron, a transient uh, iron product, which is then exported to Japan for use in electric arc furnaces for steel making. These Different options split the costs of production between the two countries to various amounts, but which are more efficient in driving down the costs of production? The levelized cost of steel production for each supply chain option is shown here, assuming our preferred technology costs for 2030 and a two and a half million tonne per annum steel making capacity. There are a few takeaways that we get from these results. <coughs> Across the value chains, energy emerges as a dominant expenditure component. In the past, we've been able to efficiently ship coal around the globe, but that's not the case for hydrogen. These results highlight just how significant hydrogen production costs are for this green steelmaking technology. It's also particularly expensive to ship steel, such as in option one. Yet despite these higher transportation costs, domestic steel production comes out as the lowest cost model. Again, I think hinting at uh, perhaps a longer term viability that these are competitive with alternate options. Green iron export, option two, is also very competitive and likely offers a, a lower risk, a collaborative pathway to more rapid decarbonisation. The numbers 
presented here uh, reflect an attempt to keep the scenarios as similar as possible. One key assumption is that everything is developed from scratch. In reality, there are a number of reasons why the costs for option two could be even lower. First of all, we could leverage existing electric arc furnaces in Japan, which would significantly reduce the orange furnace component. We would also gain access to scrap recycling from the larger volumes of steel that are consumed in Japan. We can cut this with the iron ore pellets that are fed into the process and lower the iron ore cost component shown in brown. For this option, energy reliance in Japan would be relatively minimal, so it also potentially avoids an over-reliance on offshore wind, which is really one of the factors driving up the costs in options three, four, and five. We also note that for the shipping distances modeled here, the additional energy losses associated with the ammonia conversion and reconversion don't compensate for the, the costs of just transporting hydrogen in the first instance. Though both pathways uh, were estimated to be more expensive than either green iron or green steel exported from Australia. As we think about where we're going into the future, no doubt the horizon is very hazy. There's a lot of uncertainty. But tools like the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper are valuable in being able to bring information forward to the earliest stages of decision making so that we can understand the broad contours of the problem and make better informed decisions. We've focused on one technology in DRI EAF, for which we have current process requirements and costings. We leverage this to develop a new capability for user-driven assessments of the green iron and steel production potential across Australia. This is an open capability for industry, academia, government, and the general public. The mapper provides an initial framework from which to target more detailed follow-up studies, you know, whether you're looking at examining the specific characteristics of a particular um, supplier of iron ore and the quality of the ore, whether it's your ability to access uh, established industrial workforces in central Australia, for example, or whether you want to understand better the specific port capabilities and um, how they could help support or challenge these um, models. Through demonstrating the tool, we've been able to highlight the scale of the decarbonisation challenge. Australia produces one third of global iron ore. Our production is about 900 megatons per annum. Back of the envelope, that equates to some 500 me uh, million tons per annum of liquid steel. In our example, a well-optimised one megaton per annum steel making plant required over 1500 megawatts of installed renewable energy and over 400 megawatts of battery backup. The scale of the challenge is large and so too are the opportunities. With our preferred technology uh, costing assumptions, relative low cost iron and steel production is modelled within most Australian states and territories. The current business model of extraction out of Pilbara no doubt favours that region However, high quality magnetite ores are a current process requirement. There may be more opportunities in the future to move ores to locations of cheapest energy. If magnetite ores continue, be, continue to be a requirement, then the existing business models of extracting out of the Pilbara may need to shift and actions towards net zero would take longer but it would also open up opportunities more broadly across Australia. And I also do want to reflect that there's a lot of research going on around Australia to open up the opportunities to use hematite within these sorts of technologies. And that would change the picture too. What's encouraging is that these models point towards viable pathways <coughs> in which green steel is competitive relative to traditional steel and relative to alternate production pathways with international trading partners. Estimates suggest that from forecast technology cost reductions alone, 
Australian green steel could be price competitive by 2050, but this may happen sooner, depending on international carbon border tariffs, like the EU's CBAM. In the short term, the production of green iron offers a pragmatic opportunity. It's lower cost and lower risk. If competitive, it would allow Australia to develop a domestic industry while leveraging the existing infrastructure and capabilities of our partners. Importantly, the mapper helps us to identify actions that can also contribute. Geoscience, to identify viable salt targets. Actions, to facilitate common infrastructure usage. These have real world impacts for Australia's competitiveness, and we can begin to put numbers on what those impacts might be. The mapper takes the complexity of multiple systems and shows how they interact. It maps regional advantages and site-specific characteristics. It shows how geoscience could come to influence geography in the 21st century and shapes our understanding of what the pertinent questions are. If you'd like to know more about the um, Economic Fairways uh, module, We've got a range of publications, and I'd particularly like to highlight that we've just released an extended abstract on the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. We're also looking to publish the computational codes that underpin all of this modelling and the portal too, so keep an eye out for that. I also want to acknowledge that the Economic Fairways module is just one in the Exploring for the Future program. People who are interested in the opportunities um, for Green Steel uh, might also want to look at the um, publications and the research coming out of other modules, things like hydrogen studies, carbon capture utilisation and storage, energy resource assessments, onshore basin inventories, national groundwater information and data, and of course, the Exploring for the Future Data Discovery Portal, which hosts the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. We've been developing the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper over the past few years of the Exploring for the Future program. I think with tools like this, we're beginning to see with greater clarity the details of what that future could be. So jump online, go to the portal, test out the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper, and let us know your thoughts because we'd love to incorporate your feedback. Thank you.